May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Dear Mr. Green was in his backyard looking over his fence and he saw his next door neighbor, the little boy, Jimmy, in his own backyard and he was filling in a hole. Curious, Mr. Green asked, what are you doing, Jimmy? Tearfully, through tears, little Jimmy replied, my goldfish died and I've just buried him. Well, that's an awfully large hole for a goldfish, Jimmy. Patting down that last bit of earth, little Jimmy replied, yeah, that's because he's in your cat. <laughs> Surprise! Poor Jimmy and his pet goldfish. Poor Mr. Green and his beloved kitty cat. Both of them, Jimmy and Mr. Green, had ex was, were experiencing anxiety in this moment and such an unwanted outcome. A goldfish and a kitty cat were gone. And so often, in fact and in fiction, story and saga, throughout human history, when anxiety raises its ugly head, we will most certainly be dealing with a crisis of some sort, some sadness, some jealousy, and perhaps war and death, just like in little Jimmy's backyard cemetery. Anxiety is powerful stuff. Now, it would be an understatement for me to say that election years make for anxious times. There's a lot of anxiety out there. What if my candidate loses? What does that mean down the road for me? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for our country? If the candidate that represents my hopes loses, is that cause for some anxiety, perhaps? because it seems that everyone is worried about tomorrow. Everyone is worried about tomorrow. Anxiety about the future, also known as anticipatory anxiety, is a type of worry or fear about a future outcome, an event or trend that causes distress in the now, in the here, in the present, and it can involve thinking about perhaps the worst case scenario that might unfold. And it can feel like a warning within you, a, an alarm going off, an, a warning of danger. So I ask, for instance, in 10, 50, maybe even a hundred years from now, how will the attempted assassination of a former U.S. president at his political rally on July 13th, 2024, be remembered in the annals of history? Two people were seriously injured and hospitalized and a husband and father is dead. And meanwhile, the pundits on the left and the right who sit behind news desks, who write editorials, who are the keyboard warriors behind social media, get paid a lot of money to try and answer this question in real time in the here and now. And to me, it's just that in reality, no one really knows the future for sure. We who witness history rarely understand its lasting significance because we're afflicted. We're afflicted by limited knowledge and by faulty reasoning. Life is way more complicated. It's complex and layered and tiered. So our best guesses are always that, just a guess, a feeling, an emotion. 
doesn't mean we're wrong. It doesn't mean we're wrong. But the ultimate meaning of history is only disclosed at its end when the ripples of events fade onto the horizon. For instance, how many so-called prophets have falsely predicted the apocalypse? Movies have been made about it. A lot of money's been made, but regardless of what these doomsayers might say, there will only ever be one apocalypse and it's going to be a complete surprise when the dead are raised. But Jesus did have something to say. Jesus did have a great deal actually to say about the future. Jesus predicted wars and famines and persecutions, but he also predicted the restoration of all things. So, in other words, it seems he's saying that calamity, calamity is going to come and go. That perhaps our best dreams may be broken and that sorrow is as certain as the rising sun. And Jesus spoke of all of these things, these inevitabilities that will happen, events where the only part that we play is to suffer their existence. We may not like it, but suffering is a part of the divine story of which we all have a role. We all have a part in it. So I just want to point out this morning that whatever tomorrow brings, Jesus doesn't want us to worry about it because anxiety is not a fruit of the Spirit. No, Jesus instead pointed to the world that surrounded his followers and his disciples. He pointed out God's hand at work in the midst of troubled times, not as a way of assuring them of candy canes and unicorns and rainbows after every storm cloud. He never belittles anyone's anxiety by telling them to ignore their present concerns. But no, he, he, he just wanted to point out the faintest fragments of goodness in this broken world as parables for God's generous grace. If God's compassion and wisdom feeds every sparrow, how much more does God tend to the needs of God's people Anxiety. Anxiety can only be truly quieted by holding fast to our unshakable God, our anchor amidst the storms of life. Just like the storm we read about in the gospel today, just about the storms we've been reading about the last few Sundays that are battering the disciples' boat figuratively. This morning, I want to focus on one thing that Paul, St. Paul, wanted for the people of Ephesus. And it was read this morning in our letter to the Ephesians. It's there in your bulletin, the third line down. In the letter to the Ephesians, I say, Paul said, and I quote, that Christ may dwell through faith in our hearts. That Christ may dwell through faith in our hearts hearts rooted and grounded in love, being rooted and grounded in love. And because God is love, God is the fertile soil of our heart. God is the fertile soil of our heart, the locus of love for our neighbors as brothers and sisters in Christ. No exceptions. Not even one, not even one. God does not give us a better life. God gives us God's self. He did so in Jesus and he continues to do so in the ubiquitous advocate, the spirit, the gift of the spirit upon us. It's what we do with that grace, that unmerited grace that brings a better life. 
And however uncertain tomorrow might be, even if it does look like an unfolding disaster upon you, the unending love of God is indeed sure, remains the same. So no matter the propaganda that you may hear, no matter the headline news that you may hear and see, our life's circumstances will change. There will be ups and downs, but God remains the same. I pray that we can find peace in this. And I pray that that God is not too troubled by our fatal attraction to social media these days and the many false prophets and the pundits who say this and that, blah, 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 in order to bend future outcomes to their current agenda. Because we should be grateful. We should live lives of gratitude, grateful that in the here and now of this very moment in the present tense, God is the healer of all pain. All the pains you've experienced in the past and God is more loving and gracious than any future outcome. And I pray that gratitude in the present, that gratitude in this very moment in your life, in the right now, that that will positively affect how loving and tolerant that we can be to every child of God, even when we disagree. Amen.